people on. Yep. There you go. Okay, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Matt Johnson. I'm the planning director at the New York State Tug Hill Commission. The Tug Hill Commission is a small state agency that serves the Tug Hill region, which is a 2100 square mile area in portions of Jefferson, Lewis, Oneida, and Oswego counties, and includes 41 towns and 18 villages. We provide technical assistance to local governments not-for-profits and other organizations in the program areas of land use planning, community and economic development, and natural resource management. To find out more about our organization, go to www.tughill.org. We are pleased to provide today's webinar on how to increase transparency in planning proceedings. This session will examine best practices and inexpensive or free tools to ensure the public understands the impact of proposed projects in your board's thought process in arriving at a final decision. A few housekeeping items before we get started. We have everyone muted except for the presenter to cut down on background noise. Please type any questions you have in the Q&A window and we will address them about halfway through the presentation and then also again at the end of the presentation. We are pleased to have the support of the New York Upstate Chapter of the American Planning Association today. This webinar has been approved for 1.5 hours of AICP certification maintenance credits. To log those credits, use the code number 9201539. And we'll show that number on the screen at the end of the presentation. Uh, this presentation is also being recorded and will be available on the Tug Hill Commission's YouTube channel. All attendees will receive an email with a certification of attendance and a direct link to the video in a few days. With that, I'd like to introduce our speaker today. Matt Horn is Director of Municipal Services at the MRB Group. Matt is a former city manager with a strong background in infrastructure planning, strategic development, and community engagement. He has extensive experience in municipal budgeting and finance, collaborative service delivery, comprehensive planning, downtown revitalization and economic development. His municipal consulting background includes internal process auditing, public relations, assistance and guidance, and development of local government management capacity, as well as long-term strategic planning for community growth. So let's uh, turn it over to Matt and hear what he has to say. Hey, good afternoon, everybody. Appreciate you being here. We were just uh, talking before the uh, before the session started about, um, you know, some rare, beautiful June weather out there. People, uh, people had their choice to take advantage of that or listen to some real high quality uh, uh, planning, uh, uh, planning information here today. So uh, I'm glad you sacrificed your sunshine uh, for us. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen if that's possible. Uh, here she goes. All right, Matt, is that up? Yes. All right, great. So, uh, you know, we kind of poke fun at this topic a little bit uh, with the title, you know, eliminating the mystery. One of the uh, one of the issues that I faced uh, throughout my career in local government was kind of this constant, and we'll dig into this in a minute, but this constant cynicism around. Uh, around the work that local government does. I, I kind of always felt my, or found myself in these situations where uh, I, didn't, I didn't do uh, everything I could to get information out in a timely way, in a diverse way. And so uh, the experiences that I share here today are kind of my, uh, uh, I would say, uh, experience from a, uh, from a standpoint of having stepped in a lot of holes and uh, trying to help you all avoid uh, the holes that that are lying out there. In a fun way, I think there's a lot of a lot of fun opportunities to engage in the planning process, to engage our communities in the planning process, uh, and certainly in inexpensive ways, um, so that our community uh, starts from a position of trust. The people in our community start from the standpoint of uh, of agreeing that we're all here to do the right thing. So before uh, before we get started down that path, we've got uh, a quick poll question for you. So uh, 
Which, uh, which of these jobs would you say I've never held? Here's a getting to know Matt Horn question. I want you to trust me. So uh, give, you, uh, give you an opportunity to uh, learn a little bit more about my background. I'm gonna give everybody about 30 seconds to weigh in here. All right. So it's like a, a tight race there, internet TV producer for, for, the, uh, for the win and the results. Actually, uh, one, of my, one of my bigger career disappointments was that in my hometown uh, in, uh, in Front Royal, Virginia, we had the best summer job ever. Staying out of the heat was to be a, a tour guide at, uh, at the Skyline Caverns. And I just never could crack the glass, seal, the glass ceiling to get uh, to get a, a, a solid job there uh, underground for the summer. So unfortunately, uh, I did not ever earn a position as a cavern tour guide. I was an internet TV producer uh, and uh, I, I worked for a, a company called Digital Smiths who offered me uh, at the ripe age of 22, $10 an hour to help them produce television uh, content for their web-based platform. Uh, either $10 an hour or stock in the company. Uh, I, of course, at 22, needed the $10 an hour. So I took the 10 bucks an hour. Uh, the company later sold to, uh, to a much larger company for lots and lots of dollars that uh, unfortunately I never realized. Uh, but I did get the 10 bucks an hour, which was worth a few cases of beer back in those days. So in terms of my actual local government credentials, let me see if I can get this rolling again. In terms of my actual local government credentials, Matt mentioned at the beginning, I'm the director of uh, the Smarter Local Gov Initiative, which is a, uh, a multifaceted uh, local government consulting practice within MRB Group. MRB Group is an engineering firm here based in Rochester. Uh, and I, I joke all the time when I don't think there are any MRB engineers in the room that uh, MRB had served as a uh, as an engineer to local governments for uh, for almost a hundred years and uh, working almost exclusively with local governments. And along the way, they figured out that not every problem can be solved with engineering. Not every local government issue uh, can be addressed with engineering expertise. So, uh, about five years ago, they launched their Smarter Local Gov initiative, uh, which uh, which sought to um, identify practitioners in the field who would, uh, who would be able to address non-engineering uh, type issues uh, with local governments. Uh, so I've been hired to manage that program. As, uh, as Matt mentioned, I'm a former city manager, assistant city manager and department head. Got my start in economic development in small cities. Uh, and that's really where my heart is. I, I really enjoy economic and community development. The firm also engages in long range and current planning uh, GIS mapping services. We do a lot of grant work uh, and organizational development, which is to say kind of helping, uh, helping communities figure out what the best platform for delivering services is. Um, is. And uh, we work with about 150 communities in upstate New York, Massachusetts, uh, and as far away as Texas. So another quick poll. I'm going to keep you guys hopping here today. What is your current role in the planning process? What are, wh why are you attending this meeting? And we'll take about 15 more seconds to answer that. A couple of innocent bystanders out there. I love that. That's great. Some people who just stumbled onto the, uh, stumbled onto the link. So lots of planning board members out there, some local government staff members, uh, and, uh, and good to see a couple of planning board chairs out there. Uh, I, I asked that question um, because I, I wanted to, to get back to that thought process around cynicism. Uh, there, are, uh, there are people in, in communities everywhere, and you all know these, particularly the people who are um, either on, on your community's local government staff or involved in the planning role, um, who, look at, who look at virtually every uh, project of significance with a critical eye, with a cynical eye. 
Uh, and you know, we, uh, we as local government practitioners um, tend to take it on the chin uh, when, when, we, when we mess up you know, a, a critical process, particularly a public engagement process. Uh, people are skeptical. They are skeptical of, of local government and, and the only groups that they're more skeptical of are developers. And so we're, we're, as planners, you're kind, of, you're kind of standing in between two, uh, two very, uh, I guess, uh, two, two uh, organizations or two communities that have, uh, that have really been put in a bad light uh, relative to local government. And so, some of the issues that have driven that over time um, are, uh, are our inability to get information out the door. Uh, and, and we'll talk a lot more about that in a moment. But uh, one of the biggest, you know, I, I, we do a lot of, uh, in, in small communities around, uh, I do a lot of my business in the grocery store, right? So you're in the produce aisle and someone comes up to you and says, what the heck is going on with X? Um, up here uh, in Geneva, where I was the city manager, we had Wegmans. And uh, Wegmans was a minimum of a 45 minute stop because even if you're just going in to grab a gallon of milk, that's where business uh, happens. And the number one statement uh, that is made to me by community members is, man, this is the first time I'm hearing about this. I, I just saw it in the newspaper. Uh, why didn't you tell us what was going on? And that applies across the board to budget decisions, to uh, program services, et cetera, but almost, almost always with a planning project. Um, people uh, fear change. They see, they see change happening in their communities. They're worried that the community is being taken advantage of, again, by unscrupulous developers or unscrupulous interests. Um, and we don't do ourselves any favors because uh, we have a hard time getting, getting information out there uh, and more importantly, being transparent about how our decisions are being made. Um, inaccessibility, that's uh, uh, a huge issue in local government. Um, we, our, our board members are relatively accessible. They are, you know, they're the folks that are tied into the community, um, uh, but planners, city managers, et cetera, uh, people see them as, as inaccessible, as untouchable. Uh, they're, they're in the office Monday through Friday, eight to five. Um, and so short of that Wegmans produce aisle, um, uh, if, you, if you're not making yourself available, if you're not participating in, uh, in community activities and community service, then you are, um, then you're probably seen as, as tough to get a hold of in your community. Uh, the other thing that doesn't help us out at all is the kind of archaic legal framework surrounding the work we do. Uh, the processes are complex. They, they are tough to navigate for planners, uh, much less volunteers uh, like, like planning board members and even further removed our constituents. They, uh, they don't understand the process. They don't understand uh, what, what, your, what standards you're held to. Uh, and they, uh, so they challenge it. They're, they're skeptical of, about it uh, as, uh, as they see projects come or under review and, and move forward. It's, uh, it's something that, uh, that they see, uh, that they don't understand, and so they, they raise questions with. Uh, and then, you know, the, this, these other barriers. Um, information about meetings, we, we're, we're not great at publishing that in places where people are likely to find it. Uh, the, we'll talk uh, in a moment about the back page of your, uh, of your local newspaper uh, in, in four-point font is, uh, is definitely not the place uh, where, where folks are most often um, intrigued by, by meeting information. Uh, but also, we hold meetings at weird times. We do them in locations that are, uh, that are viewed as uh, either inaccessible or, um, or standoffish to the community. And, uh, and that results in, uh, in some mistrust uh, in the process itself. And the bad news is it's getting worse. Uh, I was thinking about this as I was developing this material. Um, we were slated to do this presentation much earlier in the year before a lot of this, uh, before a lot of this current crisis um, had, had shown itself. And uh, residents these days, uh, constituents these days, are feeling empowered, uh, appropriately so. Uh, they're, they are ready to challenge everything that they know about local government. Um, and so what you're, what you're up against, something that you know, I saw, I saw a, sh a pivot, a shift in this 10 or 15 years ago with, as social media became more prevalent, uh, uh, kind of tried and true methods of getting the word out, getting the information out uh, were, were challenged and, and municipalities were, 
or ask to step up uh, and communicate in different ways. Um, uh, social media also gave rise to more engagement, more accessibility, um, which is to say more access to, uh, to local government decision makers. People's uh, decisions were questioned, people's motives were questioned um, right there on social media, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And so, uh, so that was happening 15 years ago. Uh, we were all being swept up into that um, in the last decade. And, and then, you know, the most recent challenges uh, arrived. And, and so while uh, much of the focus today uh, is on things like law enforcement, uh, in, our, in the communities that I'm working with, we're seeing the entire government infrastructure uh, be, uh, be challenged, be questioned, uh, and be charged with, with openness and transparency. Uh, and, and planning, again, is going to be right there at the center of that. Uh, there, are, there are lots of new standards that you're going to be held to. Uh, and people are exploring every avenue for remedying grievance. And so uh, if you don't respect the process, and, and moreover, honestly, if you don't re-engineer the process to get more people involved, to get more people under the tent, um, then you, are, you really are going to find yourself uh, in, in some sticky situations. And, and uh, you all know this, but, uh, but you know, with this more intense review, uh, what you're going to see uh, is public challenge. Uh, what that means to you is that uh, a process that, that was already desi designed to be fairly deliberate, um, already designed uh, to, to in be inclusive in, uh, uh, with respect to giving the public an eye on what's going on, it's going to get even more extended. Uh, people are going to show up to meetings. One of the things uh, that, that I was interested in with Zoom uh, as it related to, to COVID and the pandemic was we, we put these meetings on Zoom and, I, and clients that I work with said, yeah, but no, you know, nobody ever comes to the planning board. So uh, you know, this is likely to be a 20 or 30 minute meeting. Um, well, now people can attend from their living rooms. They don't have to uh, get dressed and come down to City Hall. They can, uh, they can sit right there in their, uh, in their pajamas and be involved in the process uh, and comment and, uh, and hear everything that's going on. It's also recorded and it replays over and over and over again. Uh, we were just involved with a, with a Zoning Board of Appeals uh, case and someone made an off the cuff statement that's been made in in virtually every uh, variance hearing anywhere, um, but but was always done under the cloud or under the cover of nobody shows up to zoning board meetings. It's the most boring stuff on the planet. And uh, now it's accessible and recorded. And we we recorded or we watched that tape over and over and over again and said, here's where the legal challenge is going to be. Here's where the here's the bad language that that was used. You know, here's the uh, arbitrary and capricious decision making process. Um, so the spotlight is on. You're under the microscope and it's getting more intense. The, that's going to create uh, political intervention. It's going to create public challenge. And so we've got we've got to be mindful of that. And what what happens then? And I know uh, um, planning boards and zoning boards are are really thoughtful about, and planners themselves are really thoughtful about separating yourself from economic development generally. Right? It's not your job generally to make sure that every development project that comes across your desk that's going to contribute to local government coffers gets through the pipeline. It's actually almost the opposite of that. You're the you you're the filter. You're the uh, you are you're the teams who look at these projects and make sure that they stand up to a community standard. Uh, and and what I what I tell local governments a lot is. What, what every local government, what every community is looking for is the benevolent developer, right? You're looking for the, uh, the person who's just altruistic and who's just traveling the country like this Johnny Appleseed of great projects um, who really isn't looking to make a ton of money. He's just looking to make better communities. Uh, and uh, to the degree that that developer exists, uh, and I imagine they do, I haven't met one, but uh, to the degree that that developer exists, they trade on their name they trade on their reputation, and they don't want to get in the mud. They don't want to show up in communities where there's a, a lack of respect for process, where the community, uh, where the community does not trust the local government, and where the pro where the process and the review is going to get dragged out because of it. And then finally, um, legal challenges. You're, you're absolutely going to face 
more legal challenges over, over the next 10 years as a result of this empowerment. And I think the empowerment is a good thing. And if we can build these infrastructures uh, to maintain the public trust and to give everybody a look inside the tent at, at, how, we're, uh, at how we're conducting these reviews, that can be a very positive thing. But if you've got unplanned, or I'm sorry, untrained planners, uh, untrained planning board members, zoning board members, people who are shooting off the cuff, people who aren't listening to their constituents and aren't following processes, uh, then you are going to see more and more legal challenges. I'm, I'm involved with a project um, that, that's just developed out recently where the, they're heading into their third lawsuit on the same building with a different issue, a different person uh, suing. And what it boiled down to effectively was the public felt shut, shut out and the, the municipality opened itself up to, uh, to legal challenge because they did not follow their own process. So you need, uh, you need respect for the process and the process needs to be engineered to engage the public in every possible way. Um, it's about trust. Uh, you know, people, there's a great, a great book out there that's, that's years old now. Um, it's called Start With Why. And uh, the author, Simon Sinek, says, people don't buy what you do, they buy, buy why you do it. Uh, and similarly, local, local uh, constituents and people who are skeptical of the process don't look at what you do necessarily. They don't look at the end product. Um, they look at how you got to the end product. And, uh, and so we know that a lot of this cynicism, a lot of this uh, skepticism about the motives of government um, has trickled down from on high, right? It started at the national level, a lot of discontent with the way that government was running there. It moves into the state level, it gets very partisan and nasty. Uh, at the local level, uh, we, we tend to, as, as uh, local government staff and, and people who are inside the process, uh, we tend to, um, to, to see all of the bad seeds that come along, but generally local government is, uh, is the one place that is working, uh, that's working well. And so uh, it's certainly the one place where we can make meaningful change. Local government, the reason I love working in cities, towns, and villages, counties, is because it works at what I call an actionable scale. It's, it's a scale that we can make a few tweaks here and there and really start to see um, our, our constituents perk up and respect what we're up to. Um, we, can, we can make minor changes to our process or even significant changes to our process that are inexpensive, that are fast acting, um, and that, that really take, take root in the community in a meaningful way much, much quicker. But that's gonna take change on our part. And to, to those of you who are already doing a lot of this, um, kudos to you. This, none, of, none, of, none of what I'm gonna share with you today is groundbreaking. A lot of it is not even new. Um, it's just things that you walk by uh, and say, yeah, I could have been doing this all along. Um, or I'm thankful I've been doing this all along. I've been doing the right thing. Um, but you know, the three buckets that, that, I, that I think about when I think about transparency and, uh, and engaging with the public um, is we've got to get deeper on the information. Um, you know, we've, we've, we, we have to be able to share every bit of the information that we have um, so that the public understands the cards we're working with. Uh, what the public most often sees is, uh, A, they don't see the, eight, the, the four point font at, on page 67 of the newspaper, so they miss the meeting. They see a newspaper article about, uh, about the planning board considered a motion to grant site plan review for parcel number 104.1.1 and they scratch their heads. And then two weeks later, there's an excavator out there and they say, whoa, you know, the community really let this get by me. Um, and it's because no one knows what parcel number 104.1.1. So if they were said, if they were, if they did find their way to page 57 uh, of the Finger Lakes Times, it meant nothing to them. We have to provide meaningful information to the public and start speaking in terms that everyone understands. This is a whole, I have personally stepped in. I'm happy to share um, uh, some more anecdotes with you on that. Um, we have to broadcast our information in a really diverse way. Uh, we have to get information to the people who are most affected by, uh, by the projects that are out there. Uh, we have, you know, we're challenged to communicate to a broad segment of the community. We're challenged to communicate quickly. Uh, and so most often we deal with a sledgehammer, this big, uh, uh, big bold message, here it is, here's what we're up to. 
uh, we're going to have to get uh, get more granular and and more and and use more of a scalpel when it comes to uh, to really working the finer uh, the finer segments of the population and that and, and we'll talk about what that means in a moment um, and then we have to be around when people are around uh, you know that I've, I've been helping communities recently through the most recent um, IDA ch uh, changes uh, le legislative changes IDA reform. Um, I'm only skeptical when a, when a higher level of government thinks they're reforming something. But uh, in this case, I think there is good reason to, uh, to reform uh, some of the practices of IDAs. Uh, IDA boards traditionally meet in the morning. They're all business people. They meet in the early morning. So these, these boards who are given significant power are making decisions at 7 a.m. on the fourth floor of City Hall, uh, where virtually no one would ever know that they even existed, uh, much less were meeting. Uh, and so planning boards are, are, are less often in that boat, but even 7 p.m. Uh, on a Wednesday night in a re rearranged courtroom um, that, that was advertised in a singular way um, is not super meaningful to, uh, to our constituents. constituents. It's not super accessible. Um, to the folks that we want um, to attend and be a, a part of this process. So uh, another uh, couple of quick questions for you. So we'll put the poll out. How are you getting your, your information out to, uh, to your constituents? How are you publishing your meetings? Just about five seconds if you haven't rung in yet. I want to come meet the sledgehammer and hacksaw folks. So that's, that uh, is very exciting. We've got a, uh, we got a lot of folks, most folks using at least two and a lot of folks using multiple, um, just a few uh, uh, who are relying solely on the, uh, on the newspaper. How about, the, the types of information that you're publishing. Can we throw that poll up there? So take a second and look at what do you, what do you post? So if you're using the website, if you're using social media, um, uh, what are you posting on your website about your meetings? About 10 more seconds. Great. So, so what I what I'm seeing uh, uh, here and and what is what I would have expected to see. Lots of uh, lots of folks using uh, or publishing just their meeting notice. That's kind of the standard, right? Uh, uh, some folks publishing full board packet. That that's really impressive, and that's that's what uh, what we're you know, what the ultimate is. What we'd really love to get after. So. Pull this down. So in terms of getting the word out, you know, there it is, the dreaded back page of, of the newspaper. Um, back to people don't buy what you do, they buy why you do it. Um, people listen to what you say and watch where you say it. Uh, I, the average American household, I say here, I did virtually no research on this statistic, so don't write it down and credit it to me. Uh, it's just, this is a gut feeling of mine. I personally don't know anyone who has a subscription to their hometown newspaper other than for, other than at the office, but that's just me. Um, I read the local newspaper to make sure that my, that my client communities aren't stepping in any holes um, and to make sure I'm not in the obituaries or the police beat. But, uh, but short of that, the, the tradi traditional media is really is dying, and that's something that we we all already kind of inherently know. Um, but the the laws, the open meeting laws, they're built they're built for the uh, the uh, for the old school, and so they are uh, they are compelling you to advertise in a very traditional way. Uh, when we're thinking about how to get the word out about our meetings, uh, you know, a couple of rules of thumb. 
you, if to the degree that you have a diverse community, diversity of age, diversity of language, diversity of background, diversity of access to technology, your communication strategy has to be as diverse as, as your population. So going strictly traditional, just publishing that public notice because that's what it says in section 600 of the open meetings law, um, that's getting you nowhere. Uh, but also a, digi a strictly digital strategy where you're only posting your meeting information on Facebook um, it's, it's equally as exclusionary. Uh, there, are, there are certainly issues around technology access that we can talk about uh, and just people who prefer not to use uh, uh, social media for this types of stuff. The other, the other piece that we're up against, we talked about this uh, a moment ago, is this, uh, you know, the, the language that we were all taught in planning school and public notice, uh, public notice 101 is you have to have the tax tax parcel number. You have to have uh, the agenda items organized in a certain way and spelled out in a certain way. And all this was built around um, around the lawyers, around people uh, who who behaved badly at some point in time. Um, so who it benefits today are the lawyers. Uh, the lawyers know exactly what parcel number one hundred four point one point one is. Uh, they know exactly what an area variant subject to the bop, 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 bop. They know all of that. Unfortunately, Joe on the street, Jane on the street, typically do not know all of that. So they're the ones who get, who get swept up in this. So when we're thinking about diversity in communication, you're thinking about new school technology. Um, think if your community has a Facebook page, um, it takes two seconds. It takes no time whatsoever to throw uh, your information on there uh, and to throw a depth of information on there, a link to the community's website, uh, which will have uh, where you can host a robust full package uh, of planning board uh, in, uh, information, project information. Uh, these also, but also these interactive tools, what we're working with today with Zoom, uh, Facebook Live, these are ways that that planning board members, to the degree that it matters. I mean, in a lot of situations, in a zoning variance, you know, the public feedback, public inclusion, public engagement, public comment, that's a small piece of what you're there to consider. Uh, but it's still a piece, and the community um, still needs to be needs to feel like they were like they were plugged into the process. So there are interactive tools that are virtually free, that are very inexpensive, um, that can help you. Uh, plug into uh, plug into your constituents. Uh, on the old school side, uh, we the law says we've got to keep publishing it. So make sure you, you keep publishing it, but don't leave it at uh, at the at the back page of the newspaper of record. Talk to your reporters. See if you can get stories about these projects out there in the narrative um, in the in the front section of the newspaper, um, so that the people who still do read newspapers will uh, will have a shot at at looking at, uh, at looking at something meaningful. Um, so the agenda item titles aren't gonna cut it. We wanna, we wanna make sure that we're providing information like a staff analysis to the degree that you write memos about, uh, about project or your planners, your local government planners are writing memos on projects, doing reviews. Uh, to the degree that any of that information can be released, all of it should be released. You really wanna paint a picture of uh, the matters before the board. We, all, we also would like to provide actual pictures so that, so that you've got context, uh, the community's got context around what's going on. But there's absolutely no reason not to have the site plans, the marketing materials, everything that that developer provided to you uh, to sell you on the project should be provided to the community to help them understand that you didn't just approve this particular development because you liked it or because the developer um, is a friend of yours that, that you, have, you used a whole stack of information here um, to, navigate the, uh, to navigate the approval process. So we'll take a quick break now for, for any question and questions and answers, I'm sorry, questions that the, um, that the group might have. Thanks, Matt. Thanks for all of your incredibly insightful, insightful insights and comments. And so far we've got one question open it's um it says an abutting neighbor mailed notices it's not necessarily in the form of a question but i'm wondering if you want to say a few words about mailed notices 
Yeah, so you know, in the in the law, uh, and and I'll start by saying I'm not a lawyer, and you definitely don't want to take legal advice from me. But um, certainly in the law, uh, certain actions will require you to mail notice to uh, to neighbors within so many feet, right, uh, of a of a particular project. So um, it it shows up in in zoning uh, in zoning text, and and it maps it out pretty well for you. What, uh, what, what, and this may vary community to community, but it maps out pretty well for you uh, how, how far out these, these notices need to go. It's typically within X hundred feet. Um, so you, you, go, you go to your, you know, in, the, in, the, in communities that have this infrastructure, you can go to your GIS folks, have them draw a circle, uh, but you, you really just need to, you need to show a best faith effort here. So, um, you can you can walk it. You can go to Google Maps. You can you can use a, a lot of different tools to identify all of the um, all of the abutting neighbors and uh, and mail those notices. One great accompanying piece to that that I've uh, that I've seen and some some communities um, zoning ordinances require it. But even if yours doesn't, uh, the communities I worked with, this particular tool wasn't required. The idea that we're going to really visually post the property um, so that uh, we, we take one of those annoying aluminum frame yard signs and drop it or, uh, or even a sandwich board um, that the planning department or the planning board owns and produces uh, that has the information on it. This property is under consideration by the planning board uh, at this meeting at this time. Um, and so everybody who's walking their dog or driving their car by or just in the neighborhood, they get drawn to these, to these signs, you know, like, like flies. They, they, they get the opportunity to at least know that the, that the subject property is under consideration. Uh, but in terms of mailing, to the degree that you got the resources, always go over and above, go an extra 50, 100 feet um, to make sure you're, you're thinking logically. The law, by the way, rarely thinks logically. Um, it's gonna it's gonna cut off people that you did that you hadn't anticipated would get cut off. So do the minimum that your law says. Uh, of course, go the extra mile to the degree that you can, uh, to the degree that you know that notices. And this goes for the signs as well. If you're gonna post the signs in yards, to the degree that you know um, that you've got a diversity of language in a particular neighborhood, it's always helpful to to stuff too. Uh, two letters in the envelope, one in English, one in Spanish or Russian or Portuguese or whatever the, uh, whatever the uh, diversity of languages in your particular community um, and, and try to do the same with, with any signage, just so you, you cover all your bases. Those are wonderful points, Matt. Thanks. And thank you, Jane, for the question. Our next question is, does Zoom really satisfy the open meeting, meetings law as well as adequately provide the public participation in planning meetings? Yeah, so not typically on the does it satisfy the open meetings law. Um, right now, under uh, under the executive order, and you got you got to thread the needle on these. And, and we've we've worked with uh, with lots of different communities who have come in, come through COVID uh, and uh, and through through this, and are just now starting to fire up their uh, their planning board and zoning board meetings again. Uh, and the people who are and their their uh, town board or, or village board meetings, um, the people who are for now are covered by Zoom. You have to, you have to um, record it. You have to put it, uh, put the link to the recording on, uh, catalog it somewhere so that people can access it later. You have to keep minutes the way you always have kept minutes um, so, that, uh, so that community members can access uh, you know, a, a relatively um, comprehensive transcript of the proceedings. Uh, but as of today, uh, I should say, as of my last check, um, the uh, uh, the Zoom or the 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 streaming um, uh, caveat expires on July sixth, which means that uh, you can't use Zoom as the way that you're going to make your meetings open. Um, at that point, uh, you have to reopen meetings, but you can always layer on Zoom or Facebook Live or anything else. Um, in addition to meeting all of the open meetings requirements. And so the first, I'm trying not to parse that question too much. The first part of the question, does it really meet the open meetings law? Only for now, apparently. And, and even, even now, um, uh, there was a, there, there's been some 
some pull apart between the governor's office and the Committee on Open Government. Uh, but for now, the executive order says these are the standards and Zoom or, or another streaming technology will suffice. Moving forward beyond the pandemic, uh, it, it won't meet the minimum test, but we're not about the minimum, right? We, we want to go over and above. And so to the degree that, uh, that you can meet all the open meetings requirements and have this cool uh, streaming opportunity, all the better. Yeah, man, I think that definitely highlights your point that having a diversity of approaches is, is always welcome Absolutely. as long as you're meeting the minimum. Yeah, that's right. Thanks, thanks for that. Our next question is from Stuart. He says, any additional recommendations on how to engage the public effectively in planning studies specifically as opposed to project reviews? Yeah, that's a great question. And, and uh, you know, th throughout the, the, the bulk of the work that I personally do in local government is, um, uh, is the bulk of the planning work, I should say, um, is around comprehensive plans, small area plans, corridor plans, that, that type of work, local waterfront revitalization plans. And we've gotten, uh, we've got really great at diversifying um, public engagement strategies there, as opposed to the planning, the planning board meeting nutsy boltsy current planning project planning stuff so uh on the uh and, and we will touch on some of these in, in a moment uh in the next section but on the uh on the big picture planning stuff uh you have the opportunity to get really interactive with people that's the that's the number one my number one recommendation is make these make these public engagement opportunities as interactive as possible so the most basic interactivity um, is the survey, right? You do your community-wide survey. Uh, and again, that's getting more and more feasible, more and more or less and less expensive um, through things like Google Forms or SurveyMonkey. And we'll talk about all those in a moment. But um, so it's, that's an easy one. You throw that link on your website and, and people are engaged and participating. You pump it out through your social media channels and you can get five, 600 uh, answers in no time or survey, survey responses in no time. Uh, but I always say, you know, um, if you're if you're if you've got a public forum at a comprehensive plan or an area plan, and the uh, and the part where the person stands on the stage and talks is longer than about ten minutes, then you're doing something wrong. Uh, the, the the comprehensive plans, the small area plans, uh, they really should happen in more of a for for lack of a better word, more of a charrette format, uh, where we I love to just have a room full of tables, the maps are rolled out on the table, and people are down there drawing. Um, we, uh, we use a, a project now or a, a product now called, called, um, Esri, um, collaborative mapping. Uh, it's, it's part of the GIS suite, the Esri GIS suite. Uh, and that's one where we can throw a map on a, a layer, I should say, on a community's GIS infrastructure when we're doing a comprehensive plan and say this week it's parks week, you know, everybody, uh, everybody go on, go online, go to the map and, and highlight your favorite park or highlight a park that would, would need some attention. Um, that's come about in the age of COVID. That requires us not, we don't have to be across the table from each other at all. We can uh, get out, uh, we can send our, our constituents out into the field. They snap a photo of a beat up playground. They come circle it on, uh, on the uh, collaborative mapping and upload the photo and the planners can see it in real time. And, and you can open it up so the community can see it in real time. So. Uh, we'll touch on a few in a moment, but, uh, but interactive, collaborative, um, the, uh, the, the, those are the names of the game. And, and again, taking it into the communities that you're serving. Doing it at City Hall is a waste of time. Yeah, I hear that that bi-directional flow of information really adds a lot of value to the process. Absolutely. And you're building policy champions along the way. You, you won't have to fight uphill when you go to implement. Absolutely. So Matt, we've got about seven other questions right now in our q and A. I I think we can answer a one or two more and then answer the rest at the end. What are you thinking? Yeah, absolutely. All right, so we've got David asking, when a municipality forgets to post a legal notice within the required advance time, it's usually excused as an oversight or just a mistake. So can there be any legal consequences such as a lawsuit based on that technicality? Uh, my, First of all, I'll give the Wade Beltramo uh, caveat: always check with your uh, with your local attorney, um, and don't don't take my word for this. But I will tell you that most often, um, uh, 
projects that are overturned on Article 78 or, or, uh, uh, or other legal challenges are overturned on process. Uh, so at a minimum, what, what ends up happening is, is the decision ends up being stayed or vacated. Uh, and, and I would say, yeah, failing to publish a notice, even if it's an accident, an oversight, um, uh, there, it does open you up to, uh, to a legal challenge around process. And that, that honestly is what lawyers live for. They really are looking for you to have skipped a step somewhere. Mm -hmm. Right. So this will be our last question for now. Thank you everybody for sending in the questions. Keep them coming. We'll get to them at the end. So this was from Robert. He says, how detailed do meeting minutes have to be? So that's a local, uh, a local flavor uh, for the most part. Uh, you, there, there's nothing anywhere that I know of that says you have to keep transcripts and most communities don't keep transcripts. Uh, so uh, always check with, uh, with the people who appointed you, right? So it, it's great to go back to village board, town board, city council and say, first, I mean, get a look at the, get a look at the clerk's minutes there at that level. Uh, the, what, what's the city clerk, town clerk, village clerk doing in terms of keeping minutes. Uh, and I would encourage you to, to try to mirror that. That's the standard that the city council has, has set. Um, the, the law is pretty vague. Uh, it's, it just says you got to keep a record of proceedings. So, um, you know, absolutely. It, it, you have to address every item that was on the agenda. If it didn't, you know, if you decided to table it, you got to note that it was tabled. If action was taken, who moved it, who seconded, um, you know, get, the, the law doesn't require you to get super detailed in, in, keeping, uh, in, in keeping track of who said what about what. Um, and so you, you, uh, I would say that's, a, that's to be calibrated uh, at the community that, you, um, that you're working with. Thanks, Matt. We'll, we'll let you take it away then and we'll answer the rest at the end. All right. So one more question for, uh, for folks here. What's the average attendance at your board meetings? And if you're a planning board member, zoning board member, uh, either way. So this is great information. Um, so five to ten is uh, is prevailing here. We can get up as high as twenty, but uh, but the the bulk looks like they're they're coming in less than twenty anyway, right? Um, and I, I I attended a great session a couple of years ago um, where a presenter told me or told us. That and, they, and that's where I actually stole that photo from, from that session. I've managed to dig it up. Uh, this is what people, this is what traditional public engagement gets you. This is what the four point font in the back of the room gets you. Uh, or I'm sorry, in the back of the uh, newspaper gets you. And so what the, what the expert at that time told us was an empty meeting room rarely has much to do with the subject matter at hand, right? It's not, it's not what you're saying. It's how you're saying it, where you're saying it. Um, it's the, uh, moreover, it's the subtext that, uh, that you've put out there um, in the way that you've uh, worked to invite people. And there are, you know, there are a couple of kinds of people in the world. One, one group of people who say, ah, they didn't publish it. They obviously don't want me here. Um, and the other group of people who says, they're trying to keep something from me. Uh, that they're trying to keep something from me crew is getting bigger. Uh, and so you're going to want to uh, you're going to want to do everything you can to check every box that you can to keep those folks um, satisfied that uh, it, it may just be that the subject matter is really boring and that uh, and we, we can't jazz up a, uh, a setback revision uh, to, to make it entertaining. Um, but uh, what we do know is to get people to meetings, we have to do a couple of different things. Time and location. Um, it's, it's absolutely critical that we're having these meetings uh, and now we're talking about every meeting, right? Um, I, I'm so thankful that someone asked about, uh, about bigger picture planning meetings uh, versus, versus project meetings. 
Uh, in this case, I'm thinking bigger picture planning meetings, those should be sprinkled out at breakfast and, and lunch and dinner and weekends and uh, anything, you know, any, anything, any place you can think of uh, to, to draw out a diverse, a diverse crowd. Planning boards, I know, you gotta kind of have a rhythm. You gotta kind of have, you gotta meet A when your board's available uh, in locations that, are, that meet accessibility standards and all of those things. So sometimes that drives you right back to, uh, to the boardroom, but, uh, but to the degree that you, you can shake it up a little bit, uh, make sure that you're enabling attendance by affected populations. If you've got a, if you've got a tough project, think about who it's affecting the most and let that steer your time and location conversation. Uh, there are other barriers, and again, this this I, I learned a lot of this through big uh, through strategic or comprehensive planning. But you know, finding an engaging activity for kids, making sure that we're getting uh, getting folks who are challenged by transportation issues to the meetings when we can, uh, and we can do that in a couple of different ways that we'll talk about. Um, and language, you know, making sure that we're we're speaking in the language of the neighborhood that we're working in. Um, and then you know, we just talked a moment ago about finding ways. Uh, to participate remotely when environmental conditions we live in upstate new york um, i've had plenty of plan not as many as i had hoped but plenty of planning board zoning board city council meetings snowed out uh where we weren't able to uh, weren't able to do something because of weather but now we've got virus and other things that that might keep us from attending in person we now know we have the tools um to uh to support remote attendance um We'll talk about that in more. I don't want to dig too deep here. Uh, so in terms of making meeting locations relevant and accessible, uh, if, you're, you know, if you've got a complex project or you're working on a comprehensive plan, a larger area plan, uh, doing it at the dais is difficult anyway. As a planning board member, I know you all do, so, and I know the city staff does too, or community staff does too, you do solid due diligence on your own. You go out, you, you look at the site, you see how it interplays with, uh, with neighboring properties. You do that personally. Um, the neighbors don't know you did it in a lot of cases. The community doesn't know you did it. And the community didn't do it. So somebody came for one issue on the planning board agenda, and now this other issue has grabbed their attention. They're completely lost if we're sitting in the boardroom as opposed to um, sitting, sitting on the site or visiting the site at 5 o'clock and doing the board meeting at 6 o'clock. Um, but, but absolutely make, make sure that where your meeting has some, particularly in complex project or comprehensive plans, has some relevance to the project that, uh, that you're working on. Um, make sure that in these comprehensive plan situations, and, and a lot of times uh, in, in the best communities, the planning boards have, uh, have some way in opportunity on long range capital plans even. So when we're doing a five year capital plan, the city manager, town manager, town supervisor, uh, sometimes turn some of that work over the planning board for review. If they're not in your community, it's something you may petition your elected leadership to allow you to participate in. Uh, but anyway, if you're participating in a long range planning engagement, make sure you're going out and looking at those facilities for yourself and hosting meetings at those sites so that the community can see uh, what goes on, why the treatment plant costs so much to operate. There's nothing like being there and seeing it. That's a bad case, but it's true. Uh, if you haven't been through a treatment plant, you're really missing something. Uh, but being in parks, uh, being in community facilities where folks wouldn't traditionally be in thinking about it this way. Um, you're in a park, you're playing with your kids, you're having a picnic, you're, you're viewing it through a recreational lens. Coming back and viewing it through a planning lens um, takes on a whole different meaning and a whole different, uh, uh, it, it brings a whole different set of circumstances to the table for people to evaluate. But again, if you're on the comprehensive plan steering committee and we're just meeting at the high school gym once a month with a picture of the park, uh, we're, we're not going to we're not going to give it the same treatment. Uh, you know, we talked a little bit about these other barriers. Um, I, I the, my local economic developer, county economic developer here in Ontario County. I remember bumping into him at Dunkin Donuts on a Saturday morning and I said, hey, where are you off to? And he said, yeah, I'm going to South Bristol. We've got a project out there. Uh, we got a public hearing this morning. People want to, uh, you know, pe this is when people can come. They had a public hearing at nine o'clock on a Saturday morning at the site where the project was being reviewed, and he was he was there for the uh, for the IDA, and uh, and that's when the community could come. That's when the community could come and actually see where the buildings were going to be sited, 
and where the planners and the developers could hear and see for themselves how this is going to how this is going to interplay with with the neighbors far too often we rely on site plans we rely on maps so doing it at the location doing it early in the morning or or, uh, or, or uh, late in the evening doing it on weekends over lunch those kinds of things whether it's a project or a larger plan uh, is something to think about more and more particularly in the communities i'm working in this issue of language uh, is is something that that really is an inhibitor uh, and it's it's disappointing everything from the meeting notice itself to the agenda materials to the review materials to the the meeting being conducted all in 100 percent english to a lot of cultural issues that may may have given the impression that you're locked out anyway uh, all of that plays into a whole swath of the community that's just disinvested in the process and uh, and as a result become very skeptical and so uh, I was fortunate in the community I worked in we had a, a liberal arts college here and uh, they had a they had a ton of Spanish speakers Chinese Mandarin speakers uh, all, uh, people who could come to meetings when we were going to be in a neighborhood uh, and the students would would translate uh, material meeting materials for us they translate uh, meeting uh, conversation or meeting meeting discussions uh, so people could hear in live in real time what what's going on um, but at, but again you can't you can't check every one of these boxes a lot of us are from these teeny tiny little communities we don't even have a professional planner on staff we're volunteering our own time to be on the planning board um, and, and there's there's two families in town who speak Spanish How, why am I going to translate everything into uh, into Spanish. Maybe you're not, but uh, when you know the project is going to affect that that particular neighborhood, do everything you can to be inclusive and to at least get meeting announcements um, published in, uh, in their uh, native language. On particularly thorny issues, um, you know what they are, you've worked with them. Uh, they're, you, 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 gotta, you gotta showcase to the community that you've done everything possible to get folks to the table. Uh, and this isn't typically a traditional planning board meeting. Um, uh, this is, the, a lot of these suggestions do are thinking about the, the comprehensive and uh, an area planning, corridor planning type, uh, type of conversations. But um, you know, collaborating with, with regional transportation groups, whether it's the county, um, the rec department, anybody who's got a 15 passenger van that we can send out into the neighborhoods and get people to meetings, um, all the better. Uh, and and uh, if it's only two or three people that got on the van, I promise you it was still worth worth your time. You'll be able to come back later and say, we did everything possible to get people to this meeting. Uh, and then the the child care piece, this isn't popping finding finding uh, Nemo in the uh, in the VHS and letting kids sit in the dark and watch this while their parents participate in planning. Find a way to make the make the relevant the material relevant to uh, to school age children so that they uh, they can participate too and, and and start to plant that seed of, of community engagement. And if it is at night, if it is at mealtime, if you can find an expensive, fun way to do it, if some if there's a local food truck for you know who who'd show up, or you can get get the uh, Mark's Pizzeria to donate a couple of a couple of sheet pizzas. Um, it's just one more thing to say, hey, we thought about this, you're gonna miss dinner, come down and, and we'll, we'll, uh, we'll keep you plugged in here. We talked about this, somebody had asked this question so we don't have to spend a ton of time on it. You, you built all this great infrastructure during the pandemic to plug people in remotely, don't walk away from it just because, uh, just because the, the executive order expires. Let's layer it on top of our traditional planning process, our traditional open meetings processes and uh, and stay plugged into it. It for a long time, probably, but until uh, until Facebook is even less cool than it is now, it, it's it, it won't show up in any kind of legislation that this will sub out for uh, for community engagement. But again, we're not here to to check the minimum box. We're here to to bring as many people as we can under the tent. So try to layer this stuff on. Listening versus hearing. This is the tough part, right? getting all these people down and do putting the surveys out uh that's great uh and at the end of the day you package it all up and put it in one of those cool file boxes and slide it in uh to uh to your to your file closet 
uh, that is the absolute lowest bar that there is. You have absolutely uh, listened to the public. The question is, have you heard, right? And so uh, what you wanna be able to clearly demonstrate is that to the degree, again, there variances, site plan reviews, these aren't decided by popular opinion. This isn't, well, 50 people said yes and 46 said no, so I'm voting yes. That's not how this works. But to the degree that public engagement, public input weighs into your decision, think about ways that you're going, uh, you're going to process that. And so someone asked a question about minutes. Um, there's no law that says you gotta write down everything that everybody said, but if you want to be above board and you want to and you want to show people that they were heard, at least try to encapsulate one sentence or the main the main theme of what every person stood up and said at the meeting. Um, if you have it, if if the if the process and the project will allow it, try to put a little time and space between the feedback you got and the decision you made. You know, the the, the worst possible scenario is. We've got a public hearing on this and the people are going to get up and there's a thousand people lined up to speak and we sit for four hours and listen and listen and listen and listen. And then somebody makes a motion. All right. We've heard that. We've heard everybody. Uh, I move that we approve. Can you imagine the confidence that is just bolts through the crowd that you really heard what they said when you vote on something five seconds after they provide you with their insight or feedback? Again, we don't have all the time in the world on these things. And a lot of times that it just gets wedged in and it has to be for whatever reason. Um, but to the degree that you have time and you want to show the public that you really are taking them seriously, getting a little time and space in between uh, feedback and decision is, is optimal. Um, and then again, we talked about this. Uh, public hearings are required. That checks the box. And it, and it can be valuable, certainly. Um, but but uh, if you really want to engage people in the process, find, find a way to make that feedback a two-way interaction. When you get this right, it's going to pay benefits. It means we're not going to be fighting uphill every time we try to implement something. People are going to take ownership of the policies you create. They're going to be champions for the projects that, that develop. They're going to see their fingerprints on the work you've done and, and feel listened to and heard. Um, that's going to spark their confidence in the market and in the community. It's going to challenge them to go back to their own neighborhoods and say, man, I it might make sense now for me to put on that porch. This place is going somewhere. Uh, and it will also bring in new investors, uh, developers who are unafraid of the process because you got your act together. Things are moving. The, yes, 100 people show up at the planning board meeting and yes, they're all heard, uh, but the planning board listens, they take action. There aren't picket, there are picket lines out front and, uh, and, there, and, and the epithets are at a minimum being hurled at the dais. Uh, from the, uh, at the, at the people making the decisions. Developers are responsive to that. And to the degree that your role, that you have a role in attracting community investment, that's what it is. It's about creating a process that the, that the community can feel confident in and that the investment community can feel confident in. So to tie it all up here, uh, you know, the way we're gonna maintain confidence, the way we're gonna stay tra transparent um, is that we're gonna show we went the 11th mile um, with respect to effort. Um, that's all that can be asked for you is that you did everything you possibly could to get information out there. Uh, we're going to try to diversify tools and technology to make sure that uh, our messaging is clear and that's easy to understand and that people, uh, people are able to access it. Uh, and this last one shows up in a lot of codes of ethics. And I love the, I love the, the phrase open and honest deliberation. Um, nobody can, nobody you, you vote your conscience, right? You vote the law, what, however you decide to make your vote. But, but if the deliberation is open and honest, uh, I, I, uh, I, it's too late for too many anecdotes, but I, I had a planning board one time who didn't believe in executive sessions, because rightfully so, they didn't, want to, they didn't want the public to feel like decisions were making, being made in closed doors. So when the, when the chair had something that he felt like he had to get out to the board, he would say, huddle up and he would bring his whole board around and they'd get into a little huddle and uh, they'd whisper to each other and then they'd come back and sit at the table and make a decision. So he didn't go into executive session, but I wouldn't quite call it open and honest deliberation. So avoid the huddle, avoid the offline communication to the degree that that's possible. Uh, make your decisions 
uh, open and honest and transparent, and, and you're going to build a lot of trust in the community. So really appreciate, uh, really appreciate the, you listening to me. Happy to take some, uh, some more questions. Okay, uh, Matt, it looks like we've got five or six more questions. Uh, the next one's from Donald, and he is asking or saying, we are struggling with getting information in a timely manner from developers. Always seems last minute, what is the norm? Yeah, yeah well, that's a, it's a great question, and, and I promise you, you're not alone. Um, you know, we're, in this, we're in this situation, again, where we wanna facilitate development. We wanna facilitate development to the degree that that's our role, we don't want to be seen as the stick in the mud, the, 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 the board that holds everything up, but you can't engage in open, open and honest deliberation. You can't get the public involved in the decision-making process if you don't have the information. So, um, you know, the, the, the norm sh is exactly how you describe it, everywhere and anywhere, all the time, and, and we want to bend over backwards to help folks out. But the best practice really is, um, you know, the, the open meetings law, I think, says you got you to have 72 hours notice of a meeting, right? So again, the minimum box is checked. You don't even have to put the, the open meetings law doesn't even require you to publish the agenda, or maybe it requires you to publish the agenda, but that's about it. Um, so in terms of what best practice would be, I'd say the planning board should have that, or the zoning board, whomever's, whoever's evaluating the project, should have that full package of developer information for seven days. That's, that's a best practice. Um, and, and so what, what you'll want to do is sit down with your, your staff, whether it's a planner or a clerk or whomever, and say, all right, here's our meeting calendar for, for um, 2020, 2021. The meeting date is the 10th, or, uh, the meeting date is the 21st. So the packets have to be in our hands by the 14th. Staff needs a few days to review it. So for the meeting on the 21st, we have to have all meeting materials on the 7th. Um, the best practice is just to build a calendar and publish it. However much time you want, you want in there. Uh, the, the the more time, the better. Uh, but I promise you, when you go into when you go into strong market communities, um, counties, those those folks, they got that calendar. And you and if you miss the meeting day or you miss the 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 submittal date, then you're on the August meeting, not the July meeting. And uh, it do, it can come across as as curt and rigid. Um, but, but to a degree, that's the time you need to deliberate. So, uh, so I think the public will respect you for it. Okay. Um, the next question is from Mitchell and this might get our best question of the day award. Um, and the question is how do you keep semi drunk sarcastic comments from being thrown at the board from all the lucky folks that wear pajamas and can now attend the planning board meetings from their living room while consuming alcohol. <laughs> all right. Uh, I, I want to please send me the link to your next three planning board meetings because I want to be there. Uh, I want to see that happening. Um, uh, I'm sure that was made in made in jest, but uh, but certainly you've got. Uh, if you don't have them in place now, I'll I'll answer the question in a in a serious way. If you don't have them in place now, rules of procedure for your planning board um, are will will save you uh, on lots of different issues, but particularly the unruly crowd issue. Uh, if you have a rule of procedure that says um, abusive language will not be tolerated and, and the chair is empowered to, you know, to escort someone out. Escorting someone out of a Zoom meeting is so much easier than escorting someone out of, a, uh, of, a, uh, of an actual planning board uh, room, uh, uh, board chamber. So, uh, so but the, I, I know the question was, was a little bit in jest, but absolute rules of procedure that deal with conduct of board members and conduct of presenters and audience members. And um, that'll, that'll protect you uh, every time. Okay, um, next question is from Brendan. And uh, it is, are there any tips on getting people to follow websites and social media? We post a lot of info, but don't get a lot of traction. Yeah, so um, I try to incorporate it in, in every bit of branding that I can, right? So um, when, when I was a, a city manager, or, um, a community development person, 
and I was a community development person before too much social, before any social media actually. Um, but on every agenda page, in, in every newspaper, on every letterhead, everywhere, I had those, uh, I had that, the website uh, address so that people could, it, it would at least jog people's minds to go to the website. So make sure that in your community branding, um, if it's a letterhead, if it's a water bill, if it's a, if it's that little cool notice that you're, that you're mailing to every abutting property owner, make sure that that information is there, is on there. Um, to the degree that you have a staff, um, I even internally with Smarter Local Gov, I kind of chastise my staff to, hey, I didn't see anybody share this blog article on LinkedIn. Like um, to the degree that you, that you do have a planning team or that the planning board members are on social media, make sure everybody's doing their part to share that stuff, um, that it's not just coming from the city or village or town account, that it's coming from the members themselves. Your friends, your personal friends and followers um, are gonna be most likely to plug into an issue versus the friends and followers of a, of a city or a town page. Okay, looks like we have about three more questions. Um, Gene is asking if a board is conducting a Zoom meeting, is it a good idea to broadcast them on Facebook as well? Um, from a personal standpoint, it's a good idea to get it everywhere you can get it. Um, the, the more, the better. And if you have the technical savvy to broadcast it in multiple places, absolutely do it. Um, and then make sure it's recorded so that it can be rebroadcast so that the link is hanging out there on Facebook and Vimeo and YouTube uh, and, and anywhere else that, that, that you can put it. But, but yeah, uh, you know, if, if you have that technological savvy and technological capability, uh, then, then multiple channels are, are awesome, absolutely. Okay, this next uh, question is kind of a comment slash question from Stuart, and he's saying online participation efforts are fine, but they often exclude LMI populations. You bet, a hundred percent. That's that was something that, and, and by and it makes the the language piece that much diff, that much more difficult as well, right? Um, but but certainly uh, the the LMI populations are are most often. Um, impacted uh, adversely by a strictly digital approach. And that's why it's got to be diverse, man. It's got to be uh, on the bulletin boards, in the newspaper. Uh, if your community has a newsletter, uh, uh, still have an analog, a, a paper newsletter, um, information's got to be in there uh, because people, people take in information in a lot of different ways. And most of the communities I work with have a pretty significant LMI population. Um, and so, so thinking about where those communities are, where, how they communicate uh, amongst each other and with, uh, with, the, uh, with the municipality, um, and then tailoring your, tailoring your approach that way. But absolutely, that's why we would never recommend a strictly digital approach. Okay, um, down to the last couple questions. Um, Jeffrey's asking, can you clarify what you said about the executive order that allows web-based meetings expiring in July? Yeah, so the last, uh, the last version of the executive order that I saw, and, and please do verify this with your local attorney, also Association of Towns, NICOM, maybe even Tug Hill has some information on it here today. Uh, but the last version of the executive order that I saw that was if you remember that early executive order, the, or the early one that suspended a lot of the open meetings law requirements, all of them came with a date and the governor has, has come out kind of continuously and extended the dates. Um, so I think the first date was, we're gonna allow this through April 15th, we're gonna allow this through May 15th, et cetera. And as of right now, I believe the deadline or I believe the expiration date of the executive order is July 6th, um, but uh, a verify that uh, because I'm I'm speaking from from a couple of days old information so don't uh, so don't hold me to it certainly verify it yourself. B, the executive order only deals with Zoom streaming yada yada as a substitute for live in person open meetings. It does not later prohibit you from uh, from also broadcasting your meetings in that way. Um, so, uh, so yeah, absolutely verify it, but, uh, but don't, you don't, you should, you don't have to discontinue it necessarily. You just have to manage it. Yes. And, uh, Matt, I want to say that we, 
at, at the Tug Hill Commission, we agree with what you said, and we do have information on our website about those executive orders and the dates. So if participants, uh, www.tughill.org, um, we do have information and links to some of those executive orders. Our, our last question, it looks like, uh, for the day is from Victoria. And the question is, how do you get commentary that is specific to the topic at hand from the public? Finding it difficult, especially with multiple platforms, Facebook Live, Teletown Hall, webinars, et cetera, to keep people on topic and not using it as a platform to, to, to discuss any and all issues they have within the community. Yeah, and that's that's a such a challenge all the way around. Um, I I watched a, a local government um, here here where I work. Uh, they they set up this weird public comment thing where they would have agenda specific public comments at the beginning of the meeting and non agenda specific public comments at the end of the meeting. And there's always like a cute uh, and I, I get by cute I guess I'll say snarky or I don't, I don't know a, a better word for it, but there's always like a, somebody who knows how to thread a needle and they get up and, and you know, the, the agenda item is uh, approval of the 2019, 2020 budget. And they stand up and say, I'm standing up to comment on the 2020 budget. And I just want to uh, say that I'm very disappointed that the city is not having a 4th of July parade this year because uh, it's that's certainly a budget matter, and and so and then it just takes off in a different direction, and uh, and so the my best my best uh, uh, advice to you on particularly on social media as a standalone. So think about social media as a as a standalone or survey top or survey opportunities would be isolate the issue um, to uh, to a single post. So hey, we're looking for feedback on this project not on how the planning board operates or how the, uh, you know, if you throw an agenda up there, there, a full agenda, then that does kind of create an opportunity for a snowball effect. Um, but if you pull off particularly thorny issues and say, hey, uh, we, we're, I hope the community uh, recognize that we're looking at a use variance, which means that you know, 237 uh, Jefferson Road can now be used uh, as a tattoo parlor. Uh, what do you think? And then let folks, you know, start to comment from there. But it's human nature to want to be heard and to wedge in your, your own personal bias or your own personal issue. So I'm not certain there's a there's an ironclad way to avoid that. Um, but to the degree that you can parse these issues out into their own specific channels or posts, um, that, that's one tactic. Um, uh, Matt, Matt Johnson, did you want to say anything else? Uh, it looks like we did get one more question uh, from George, uh, and it's on the Freedom of Information law, what are the number of days that, do that a document from an active application must be provided to the public? That's a great question. Unfortunately, it's it's really specific, and I don't want to give you an answer because I, I don't have that information um, uh, at the top of my head. Um, but I will tell you that um, the Committee on Open Government has a fantastic website. So if you if you go to uh, if you go to Google and and search for New York State Committee on Open Government, they've got um, reams and reams of guidance and and um, and committee opinion and other other things that'll guide you. Great. Well, um, it looks like that is all the questions that we have. Um, so, I'd like to thank Matt Horn for doing a great job. That was really, really engaging and really interested, in, interesting. And uh, I think we got all got a lot of uh, really good ideas from that presentation. Thank you all. I enjoyed it. And we, uh, you know, we want to reiterate the uh, AICP certification maintenance uh, credits. Um, the session's good for one and a half hours. And the 